but really like as a martial artist the the goal it is to build up the, the people right like a female or an older person Hey there, you're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 664, with today's guest, Professor Juan Pablo Garcia. Who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm founder here at Whistlekick, host for the show, and, well, everything we do here at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see all the things that we're doing, because it's a lot more than this show, well, visit whistlekick.com. That's our online home and one of the things you'll find there is our store. And if you find something in there you like, make sure you use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Our podcast has a website all its own, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out twice a week, and the goal of the show, and really of Whistlekick overall, well, it's to connect and educate and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help the show and the work that we do, there are a number of ways you can help. You can make a purchase or share an episode, maybe follow us on social media, tell a friend about us, pick up one of our books on Amazon, leave a review. Uh, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, and Google are the most important ones. Or you could support our Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. Patreon's a place, if you're unfamiliar, where we post exclusive content. And if you throw a little bit of money in, you get access to at least some of it. The more money you throw in, the more access you get. And we even give you bonus merch, stickers, shirts, hoodies, all kinds of cool stuff on top of it. Yeah, it's a great deal, which is why people don't stop doing it. Today's guest has some elements of his story that are familiar to many of us, maybe even most of us getting some initial exposure to martial arts training as a child, but then saw something, watched something happen that completely changed his life. And over the next few years, really dove headlong into what he saw. And the result today is, well, it's something that I think a lot of you are going to relate to. Instead of spoiling it, I'll let him tell you all about it. Hey, JP, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, thanks for coming on. Well, this is always the toughest part of what I do. And, and anybody who's listened to the show for a long time knows that sometimes these initial I don't know, kind of uh, statements, conversations, the, the first bit of what we do, it's always a little tough because we don't, you, you and I don't have any time in together. And sometimes it just, it, it flows really well. And sometimes we take a little while. And I, I feel like we might be in the latter. And that's not a bad thing. But it, what it does mean is I'm going to very quickly hand it over to you <laughs> so I can listen to you because that makes it easier for both of us. So let's, let's do that. Martial arts. You got started at some point. There was a day where the day before you weren't training and then... The day you know that that day you were so what does that look like when did you start how did you start why did you start all that good stuff that's a pre- pretty cool thing to to think about it that way you know try to remember the, the day before you start um I, I can't really like pinpoint uh a moment i um i remember when uh, i was uh, a kid my my parent, my my dad is, was in the military, so we travel a lot, and uh, we live in, uh, in 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 South America, in Europe. And uh, when I was a kid, the, the first kind of uh, self defense situation that I remember, uh, we lived in Colombia for a couple of years, and there uh, I was bullied because of my, my accent. Uh, so the uh, it was a, a a kid, a big kid in the in in my class. They was kind of like uh, the leader in the in the situation, and uh, you know I was I was crying, and I I remember I hit him with my uh, lunch bag. I have like a box, like a metal box, and I I hit, mm. I hit the kid. Uh, but then we are, we were all crying and, you know, so, uh, 
I remember my parents put me in, I remember, I don't remember if it was karate or taekwondo, but that was kind of my first uh, martial art as a, as a kid. Um, fast forward, you know, I grew up uh, in, in Ecuador. Uh, as a teen too, I was a little overweight and uh, again, you know, kind of normal. Uh, fights at the school but i always been like interested in i i did boxing uh i always been in some kind of a uh, martial art uh but later i saw the first ufc and mm. you know usually people all the guys who put it, i have an older brother too 10 years older so i think i was always like catching out trying to defend myself at home too <laughs> Uh, but, um, then I saw, Ho uh, Hoyce Gracie fighting and he was, uh, very, pretty small and skinny versus bigger people. So I said, man, I want to do that. You know, I wanna <laughs> be my brother, I want to be able to defend myself. And, you know, uh, so that was, uh, uh, you know, I got my yellow pages. I talked to my mom. I said, you know what? I want to, I want to do jujitsu. Uh, my mom bring the yellow pages. He kind of support me on what I wanted to train, and we uh, we, we didn't fight jujitsu in our, back in Ecuador. I found uh, judo, so if I sound kind of familiar, and then uh, I, you know, went to the this place, and everyone was wearing the the geese, so it looked like jujitsu. It looked like Hoist Gracie. So yeah, okay, I, I try it. Uh, so I stayed in judo for a little bit uh, before I found. Uh, an academy who was uh, affiliated to Hoist Gracie, um, an instructor was a blue belt. So that's kind of how I started. Um, yeah, I think I went in a, in a rant, but that's kind of how I started in the current martial art that then I dedicated my life to. Um, yeah. Okay. Right on. You know, I, I remember what it was like, you know, I was, I was young, I was what? 11 12 when that first ufc came out but i was training and i remember what i remember most specifically was no one in america at least around me mm. understood understood that in portuguese that r was an h right so mm. we're running around talking you know calling this guy royce mm. and it was so fast that people recognized who he was what he was doing and that he had mm. something a little bit different now I'm wondering because growing up, he was also the first athlete from South America that I would have been able to name. Mm. Was there a point of pride for you there being, you know, not Brazilian, but from the same area in a, a, a landscape that didn't seem to pay attention to people from your area? Mm. You know what? Like, no, no. Not really. I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, okay. say it that way. For me, it was uh, uh, I was very young, and for me, they were like idols, and uh, I didn't mm. really uh, uh, think it about it of like taking pride of someone from South America in general uh, coming to US. More uh, for me it was this like a uh, mystery of like. Uh, you know the um, the an art that we don't know before before I did jujitsu for me like in my mind uh, it was only punching and kicking so I never even thought to be on the ground um, and uh, yeah I had I had a situation in the in at the school I think uh, uh, a kid just one year older than me I think he did uh, I don't know if he did judo or what he did but. We got in a in a little fight, and he uh, he took me to the ground, and I didn't even know how. But he 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 mount me, he sit on me, and mm -hmm. for real, the only thing I was thinking was like punching from the bottom. I didn't even you know try to grapple or anything. I was just kind of punching, and then they separated. Uh, but then when I saw again this uh, the first UFC, I said, "Man, I, yeah, like it just changed how I was thinking and and." Uh, yeah, I just was real, but for me it was, uh, yeah, they, they were just like, like, like idols, right? Like, I don't know, like really wanted like to meet them, to learn more, to travel, uh, 
uh, and meet like people from the Gracie family and kind of follow the art and learn more. You know, it wasn't it wasn't too much information. It wasn't YouTube or information at that time. Mm. You know, so I yeah just okay. start traveling and trying to learn. Okay, but you were doing judo at this point. I did, I was doing judo uh, and boxing and uh okay. yeah but then when i found it, this school I, I i changed like yeah immediately <laughs> how, how long after you started judo did you find that school because if i heard you correctly when you started judo is because there was no jujitsu yeah i in your I did, for you to train yeah i did like around a year okay around a year yeah before i found right. the the school and was it what you hoped it would be I remember when I entered the place, the owner literally have us uh, watching a video of the UFC. And he said, yeah, that's what we <laughs> do. You know, so he put like, oh, it's Gracie uh, in the TV. I said, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> that's what I want. But this, the school was, uh, they did, uh, it was more like an MMA school. They did, uh, they had like Kung Fu, they have, um, Oh. Yeah, they did a uh, um, striking, and they have like actually jujitsu two two times a week. <clears throat> that wasn't common back then. I mean, so ninety two, we're talking. I mean, there were very few MMA schools at that point. That that's yeah. remarkable, and it and yeah, um, probably a, a a big piece of why you train and do what you do now. So coming out of you know, you'd, you'd had a little bit of experience with, you know, whether it was karate or taekwondo when you were younger and a year of judo, you got some time boxing and you step into this school and it's feeling good. And what did, what did it, what was it like? What were the next few months like? The next few years like? What did you find? Yeah, training there, uh, it really... I got a super, uh, in, I don't know if the word is in merch, but uh, I, I dive into, uh, into the training. I, I literally like got, got off of school and, and go, uh, yeah, four, five, six hours, like all day in, in, in the school. I try to uh, be in all the, in all the classes, spend time there. And uh, it really was, uh, uh, from from very early, like I I was in love of of the training. I knew I I wanted to do that. Uh, I don't remember how many years after I start. Uh, Hoyce Gracie went to Ecuador to do a, a seminar, uh, and really at that moment when I when I met him and you know what he was doing, I I I, I knew I, I wanted to do that like. I said, man, uh, even to my family, I said, yeah, I want to, you know, get my black belt. I want to travel the world. I want to compete. I want to uh, teach. And very early I knew I was lucky that, that I knew what I wanted to do and, and never, uh, yeah, never did anything else. I always worked towards, towards that. Mm. Okay. And what was next? You know, if we, we plot out your journey, you know, what might be the next chapter in this story? Yeah. So uh, at that time, well, Ecuador, it was, uh, we were maybe like uh, four or five blue belts. I, uh, my instructor was a blue belt too. Uh, but at that trip, Hoist Gracie promote again, it was like, the, I think the first four or five uh, blue belts in Ecuador. Uh, mm. so it wasn't, uh, yeah, we didn't have a black belt in jujitsu in the, in the, in the country. And the only tournament that we had there, it was, a uh, one MMA event a year at the end of the year. It was kind of like an open, uh, you have like some weight divisions and then you have like an open with, where all the divisions can fight. Um, so I was participating in that. I did uh, maybe four years of that event, but I wanted to dedicate more like only to jiu-jitsu. Um, mm -hmm. So this, 
Well, I started around uh, 14, 13, 14. Uh, but then later, uh, almost at finishing school, then I started, uh, for like normal, there is very normal, like a lot of party, like all weekend. So again, all year, it didn't have events, but then uh, getting closer to the end of the year, then it was kind of like a goal where, you know, I stopped party, I stopped uh, kind of being on focus and focusing on that. But uh, really, like, I felt that I have to leave Ecuador to being able to compete more, dedicate only to jiu-jitsu. And I wanted to yeah, just focus my life towards that, right? So we, after one of the the MMA events, my, my parents say, okay, you, uh, you know, you should go and and pursue this so i moved to brazil for a little bit um so that was next i think that was my first i I don't remember exactly if i came here to us first uh to compete and then i was going back and forth but then uh i then i moved to brazil for a little bit to spend time there uh just to get more experience i wanted to you know again pursue my black belt um Mm. So I spent some time there. I did the last, the last year, I, I believe it's 2006. It was the last year the world was uh, held in, 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 in Brazil, from the, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world. Um, so I went, uh, complete that year. Then uh, I went back to Ecuador for a little bit, but all the, then everything moved to US. So all the main events, uh, it was a lot of a school, a lot of black belts uh, here. My brother was living in Florida at that time. So I was able to move uh, with him for a little bit. And then, um, yeah, I just stayed here in the U.S., competed more, uh, trained. And, you, know. you, There were some words you used. I, w- I want to go back. Yeah. You said that you wanted to dedicate your life this that that's a strong statement mm. and when we've had guests on the show who we've talked about going all in on anything whether it was competition or a school or just training in general for all, most of them it's because they found something in what they were doing that they hadn't realized they were missing what was it about what you were doing that you said this is so much better or so important or so clicks for me and who I am that it deserves all of this time. Um, Man, I don't know, but when I have my instructor's meetings now at, uh, at my school and I always talk about uh, when I was a, a teenager, I start uh, training and I start going up in belts. My instructor, you know, sometimes put me on the front to lead the warm ups. And just that, you know, to be on the front and leading the class, I always like feel like uh, I don't know a lot of took a lot of pride and I feel, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I just love it. Like a privilege to be able to, to, to help or, or lead the class. I just feel that, that feeling I never lost it. Like for me mm-hmm. daily, my, the highlight of my day is to teach my class. Like really, I don't know, like, uh, uh, so I never lost that, that feeling. And I always look forward to plan my class, go teach is something the the, drive me and uh, yep and now i'm gonna be 40 but really that feeling uh the i remember as a teen leading class the it was uh i don't know if you say like a a, a rush it may it's it's different rush like when you compete then uh but i but i love it the this uh the feeling and uh, I knew that's what I wanted to do, like oh, always. Okay. So you're talking about teaching now. We, we've got some ground to cover in there, mm-hmm. right? So you, you, you go to Brazil, you come to Florida and the U.S. 
living with your your brother i think you said and if you came to the u.s it was it was for a reason was it was it to train was it to compete what was what was the why what's the why in that move that's a big move uh, yeah i feel uh, at, at the beginning very early i did wanted to do mma in ecuador again we had only that uh, event a year and uh, the that i was talking about uh but Brazil had a lot of events, uh, only jiu-jitsu, but then in, in U.S. was, again, the, the main, um, I don't know, like a powerhouse, right? All the yeah. bigger events, everything, jiu-jitsu started moving here, like the, the jiu-jitsu events. It had, uh, the Gracies had, uh, uh, I think it was like a Gracie Open or something like that. That was the first event that I came here. So, so I, the first time I came to, U.S. was to California to participate in these, uh, I don't know if it was Gracie Open, Gracie Challenge, something like that, but it was uh, no time, uh, no time, only submission uh, grappling event. Uh, so I competed in that, in that same uh, weekend, they have a seminar with Master Helio Gracie. Uh, so, yeah, I, I came to the event, um, to meet Master Helio, participate in the, on the seminar and the tournament. And sorry, I, I, I lost track of, of, the, of the question. <laughs> Can you repeat what you asked? <laughs> it's okay. There, there's, no, there's no requirement that you ever answer my question. The, okay. the goal here is to help you Amazing. tell your story. So just, just keep going. Amazing. Keep going. Amazing. Um, uh, you were at the seminar and... Yeah. So uh, I just don't remember if you asked me about teaching or or what I was. Uh, well, just kind, kind yeah. of the, the gap between you. There's there was a point in time where you said you wanted to dedicate your life, and, mm. and there's a move to Brazil. There's a move to the U.S. Yep. And you're talking about how it feels to stand up in front of a class mm. and teach. Mm. Well. Not everyone who dedicates their time to martial arts ends up teaching. Mm. At some point, you decided, I want to teach. Mm. At some point, you earned your black belt, which mm. anyone who, who's been training a while knows that uh, it, it's difficult. And it's, in, in most organizations, particularly difficult in BJJ. Mm. Yeah. Um, I... Yeah, I think again, like from the when when just moved here the the, the first time, I, my idea was to train and and, and get MMA fights. Like that, uh, that was kind of like the way we start training too, because it was a, a, a Gracie Jiu Jitsu. We see a, a whole Gracie fighting, so kind of like the the flow of of being involved in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was to fight MMA, maybe. Teach, right so i didn't i didn't have a idea like how um to make jiu-jitsu my life or you know, my profession um uh, mm -hmm. so yeah I, when i'm when decide to move to us again was to get more experience and really was finding trying to find uh, a team or a black belt where i can be under so i can continue my training and getting my 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 black belt I, in Ecuador, again, we didn't have, um, uh, other black belts in, in town. And when I finished school, I really was, I had to start working. I have to go to university and then I also had to train. So there was a lot of, uh, things, a lot of, uh, normal life things that happened. That I, I feel that I, I kind of had to stop training for a little bit and I just didn't feel good. Um, mm. so once I made the decide to, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to waste time because I always travel, do, you know, participate in seminars or compete a little bit and then come back. Uh, but then I felt that I kind of was, was wasting time. Like I go two step forward and then go back to the car and, and back up. Right. So yes. I made a decision, you know what, like, I'm just going to you know, go, I'm not going to come back until I get my black belt. Uh, 
So, and really like how I see my competition part, uh, also to calm the nerves, but in my head, uh, I compete to be a better instructor. Like I always wanted to, again, have a, a, a school and, and, and teach. That's always been my passion. Uh, but I did want to compete to have better answers, right? I can't like teach something that I haven't done before. Um, so that's mainly, uh, why I look to compete a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. but always my passion be, have been, uh, teaching. So maybe again, just to be a better instructor, have better answers, know what I'm doing. Um, and yeah, also at the beginning, you don't know kind of what's the path. Do I have to fight MMA? Do I have to do jiu-jitsu tournaments? Like, you know, it, it wasn't a clear path of how do I have to, or what do I have to do to be successful having a, a school, right? Sure. Sure. Let, let's talk about your time competing in MMA. Because one of the things I've heard from people, I, I've never stepped in the ring in that context. <laughs> One of the things I've heard from people who have is that it's very different than, you know, even getting hit hard in training. It's mm. different than, you know, mixing it up at, at school, you know, even if you're uh, mm. hitting a kid with a lunchbox. <laughs> I'm going to guess you remember your first fight pretty well. Yeah. Could you tell us about that and what that experience was like? Yes. So, yeah. It, Ecuador is, uh, you know, in South America, small, uh, small country, you know, everyone knows each other. And uh, before I feel, uh, because the culture is, uh, they, they party a lot, you go out a lot. And we were like the first, uh, I feel the group uh, doing jujitsu. And it was very common to have like, fight fights on the weekend right so <laughs> almost every weekend was very very common to get in some kind of fight uh so the time that i have this the first uh mma competition they had i kind of feel like i had to uh yeah kind of like an obligation that i have to be there right like uh and um yeah, the 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 first, you know, it, it wasn't like it's a, a, a one fight like it's now. It was like a little tournament. So I had like three, I remember I had like three or four uh, matches. But uh, yeah, the first one was very like nerve, nerve wracking, right? Like a, a lot of adrenaline. But at, at that, I, I don't feel I have the same drive right now. I, I do know like younger was a little bit more wild. So I was like very excited. I don't know if it was like too too uh, nervous, but I know I was very excited uh, just to be there. And yeah, once uh, you know, you kind of get nervous. I feel that I get nervous till the second that you touch gloves. You know, the second you, you already start kind of throwing, then like you, all the nerves are 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 gone, right? I think you get like in a zen or like a state where you are hundred percent focused on on the fight, what are you doing? And all the nerves are gone. But before that, for sure, I, I, I feel that I, I needed to go to the bathroom many times and, you know, uh, very nerve wracking. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Okay. Given that most of us just by numbers, aren't going to have that experience and that, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you are not still competing in MMA. No, no, I don't. I, okay. Okay. Yeah. But but there are lessons there. Mm -hmm. And there specifically a, a lot of people, even in the traditional martial arts community, will point to MMA for uh examples of things that work, things that don't work, uh attitudes, training protocols, things like that. What did you take away from your time in MMA that you brought into your own training and to your school? It's a good, good question. I feel that the, the, I, I learned a, a lot of uh, discipline at that time. The, the school where I was, uh, again, it was a very traditional school. So I feel that 
that school was first a um, like a traditional martial arts. I know they they used to do uh, kickboxing tournaments. They the the instructor was a uh, I don't know. He did kung fu. He was a, a judo black a brown belt. Um, so they, he did have uh, a lot of uh, martial arts uh, knowledge, but he ran the school very traditionally. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all the bowing and I don't remember now, but the names, uh, certain uh, uh, names or, or phrases that you say when you start and finish the classes, they, they do ka- uh, karas too. Um, so in that aspect, I feel that I always was in a very disciplined, uh, path, like, um, like martial arts and really the, the competition in, in, uh, in MMA at that time, it was just kind of a product of, of the type of training, right? We did a lot of, uh, again, sparring and, uh, and it was a striking takedowns. And because we have uh, uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu too, we did ground. So again, he started putting together these events uh, every year. So it was kind of like the, the, the flow or the result of the type of, of training that we were, we were doing. Hmm. I, I would imagine that go ahead sorry. please yeah i um yeah again i feel that on with that experience like once you taste um once i taste the 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 jiu-jitsu techniques and the uh again it was very limited and i remember that you learn like certain techniques in certain belt and then you see other higher bells, like, uh, you know, doing different things. So the, the advanced training, for example, was in separate hour and kind of closed door. So you always have like that. They had like this, like, uh, mis- mystique or mysticity. I don't know how you say that. Mystic is that word? Mystique? Mysticism? Yeah, maybe is that where you're going? mysticism. Yeah, it was kind of like, you, again, like, you, you don't know. You're curious. You want to learn more. So that, that, that hunger, you know, to to, to learn and, uh, yeah, I feel that that's kind of what it, it made me have the decision of, of leave actually uh, Ecuador that I feel that I spent, uh, many years, uh, you know, dedicating time in, um, like striking or, or, or karas, uh, also jujitsu, but again, because it was such a mix of, of, of martial arts that I wanted to only learn jujitsu, right? I start, uh, I remember I had a, I don't even remember where I got it, but I had a, a book, it was, it was some copies of, of, uh, of a jujitsu book. And I start kind of uh, focusing more on a study that and putting more time and, and training with friends. Uh, and I did felt how my I was um, kind of getting ahead of 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 people that were were training with me, right? And um, yeah, that's again that's the reason I feel I made the decision to to leave and pursue specifically uh, jujitsu, like a fast. I, I wanted to only dedicate to that specific art. Um, yeah, find a place where uh, mm. like w- where we have a black belt where I can continue uh, training to towards towards my towards my black belt. How did you feel after you earned your black belt? <laughs> if you see, it's a I have a it's a video somewhere um, when I got my black belt and I man I couldn't even even talk like for me it was. Uh, um, yeah, just, just such a crazy, crazy ride. Um, I feel that I left a uh, home, family, friends, 
uh, pursuing this uh, thing and uh, move from a lot of places too. So like, mm. you know, I so that that moment was just kind of uh, yeah the. Yeah, it, it, it was kind of surreal, and I I just couldn't, you know, I still crying. We were very emotional. My 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 parents went to 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 the event when I go promoted. So it was it's a, a lot of a lot of emotion. I, I always feel the um kind of left left behind family and kind of my um. Yeah, it's kind of my, my uh, no, no, no friends, but yeah, my, more and more my family that I kind of left behind and lost a lot of time of uh, now as an older, right? I, I, I feel that I less left behind uh, a lot of things like dear to me, uh, pursuing this, this path, you know? So it was very emotional when, when I go promoted, really couldn't even talk well and that was very emotional you mentioned your parents mm. and that was going to be my next question so let, let's run with that mm. they were there at your black belt promotion and it sounds like they had at least uh some part in getting you started you know maybe, mm. maybe not setting you on the path that you ultimately ended on but there was some validation there they had encouraged you to start training mm. what were their thoughts or are their thoughts of the path you took the arts you trained in your competition your school you know if, if, if i took five minutes now and pressed pause and say called your mother mm. and asked her about all this what would she say Mom. man i feel my, my parents have a big part in 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 everything they are you know very very dear to me and they always uh, support and encourage me really and do any anything that that i wanted to do to do it like the best the best i can right? to be the best in whatever i wanted to do but uh, from the beginning my parents always you know support me like you know to travel and um and pursue pursue the pursue the, the career you know pursue my passion mm. so i i do feel a lot of uh, gratitude you know i had the the lot i was lucky the my parents like support me on 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 traveling too right like uh, economically to be able to go to brazil and, and make the trips when i was young uh to travel to to us to compete and so i'm forever like grateful for for the support for sure huh. my, my anyone sorry. go ahead <laughs> my mom's getting kind of nervous for the injuries and stuff stuff like that but <laughs> yeah but she's happy that's a mom that. thing yeah. <laughs> I think I think every mom gets worried. Yeah. If if not, if the mom, if people aren't getting worried about their kids getting banged around in martial arts, then then maybe they're not paying attention. Doesn't mean they stop, but yeah, that's that's definitely a parental thing. Okay. So let's talk about your school because this sounds like the focal point. Now mm. this is the hub yep. of of everything you've done and what you may do in the future. When I talk to school owners, I find that all of them have at least some aspect of their school that they're very proud of. If I was to step foot in your school now, what would you point out to me? What would you show that you're really proud of in your school? One thing that is our, I feel that is our culture. And when I talk to new students, like what, uh, what made them choose our school is the the family and welcoming environment. Like I try to really make feel people comfortable. I know, like stepping foot in a martial art a school or anything new is very uh, maybe nerve wracking. Uh, you know, maybe an uncomfortable experience. So I 
try to have the culture in my school, the, not just the coaches or instru uh, instructors or staff to be uh, very welcoming and friendly, but really all the students uh, are very supportive and, and helpful with, uh, with everyone and, and, and new members, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I think the, that Latino part of, uh, you know, we are, I'm very used to a uh, hog or, or, or but in, in South America, we would give a, a kiss when you say hi here, mm -hmm. you know, very fast. I, I learned that you don't kiss on the cheek. Like <laughs> when I move here. No, no, that's reserved for very close friends. Exactly. <laughs> so that was a little shock when, when I, when I moved here, uh, but yeah, we, you know, but at least like a, like a hug or, or like, you know, like friendly, friendly, friendly hellos without kisses. Yeah. <laughs> was, was that welcoming atmosphere something part of your past schools? Or was it something that wasn't there and so you recognize it was important? Why did that become a priority mm. for you? Yeah, I tell you the again, like the uh, culture-wise, mm -hmm. at home, I give you an example. The because um, uh, okay, for example, we have a, a my mom has a, a a party in the house, like I don't know, like a tea party or whatever with 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 uh, with her friends. When you get home, you have to say hi to every single lady in the house by like, you know, you walk around and kiss, mm. right? And I feel uh, different than in US. Usually somebody gets, you know, in a, in a house and it's a lot of people, you kind of, or, or don't say anything or kind of say hi to everyone yeah. right from the far. Uh, but for us, like if I do that, it was, it was rude, right? You get in trouble with your parents. So it's like, you have to sure. go one by one and, you know, greet everyone. So culture wise, uh, I have that in, ingrained, ingrained in me. Like it's yeah. just kind of rude if I don't acknowledge the person and, and say hi to everyone. Um, that makes sense. Mm. Br bringing, bringing the wel welcoming culture of your home into your school and making sure everyone feels individually acknowledged. I think that that's something that's really important. And yeah, it's something that doesn't happen in a lot of schools. What happens in most martial arts schools? The instructor comes in, everyone lines up for class, and there's a group exchange. You know, in, in karate or taekwondo, it might be a bow, and in, in other martial arts, it might be, you know, um, a mantra or mm. just an acknowledgement mm. but it sounds like you make an effort to go beyond that mm. now i'm gonna guess because of that your students stick around longer than maybe some of your competitors some of the mm. other schools is that true Probably again. Uh, I I been in the schools before too. Uh, the I think like the the roots of or the background in jujitsu, you know, they are um, kind of fighters and the tough guy and you know the cauliflower ear, like the tattoo, the shaved head and uh, yeah. kind of that culture. So I also been in in places like that where. You know, you kind of can't even say something. You have to be careful how you say because then you get beat up, you know, very tough environment. So I did want to really always to remove that part. I feel that you don't have to, uh, you don't have to overact tough to be tough, right? Like uh, you can be very friendly and welcoming and also be tough. I feel like you, you show it you know, in your, in your technique and how you train. But, uh, I do completely kind of dislike the, the acting tough, uh, outside. I don't know if I'm making sense, but, uh, it's kind of the, yeah. the, the, that attitude of, you know, 
like like uh like like be superior or someone or or i don't know or maybe bully mentality i i really really di- dislike uh so i just make sure that they have always that in check like with anyone in 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 the school in, in my school and uh uh, for staff, like they, of course, I, I, uh, talking about the culture, I just wanted to, to go out of their way, their way to always say hi and bye. And I think it's, in, it's important to acknowledge people, right? I think like the worst thing you can do, uh, just talking about any, any business experience. If you go to eat in a restaurant and the person on the front don't even acknowledge me or ask me, you know, in certain amount of time, uh, you know, how can I help you or, or welcome or I'll be with you in one second, you kind of start feeling, uh, you don't really want to eat there, you know, start feeling annoyed or not right. welcome. Right. So I just feel it's very important. Right. You talked about bullies earlier. You mentioned bullying just now. <laughs> Martial arts. Inevitably is going to attract in a bully. Mm. I'm sure at some point you had someone who maybe came to train for, I would call it the wrong reasons. Mm. Quite often, you know, when we see that in BJJ, it's someone coming in trying to throw their strength around. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have skill yet, but you know, maybe they're bigger, maybe they're stronger and they're trying to dominate other people with that. Mm -hmm the way I'm used to hearing schools deal with that is that they will pair that person up with someone who's going to uh, show them that skill will overpower strength. Mm -hmm. Is that how you handle it in in your school? I'm going to tell you uh, uh, just uh, one experience and then uh, a little bit how I used to to do. but I was training, and uh, it doesn't matter the place or, or, or names, but I did have uh, a... <laughs> uh, no names. Yeah. We don't need names. Yes. It's okay. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was one belt below uh, this person. He was the, the, the black belt kind of covering class or teaching that day. And he did have a little this attitude, a little uh, kind of boot instructor and uh, uh, kind of joker a little bit. and. Uh, yeah, he. We were doing a nogi training, and yeah, I think was, I think it was a brown belt. But again, my my brown belt because I didn't. Uh, uh, I travel so much. I, for example, my my blue belt. I think I, I had like seven years of my blue belt, right? So I had a little a long time already uh, uh, doing grappling. And because we did MMA before in that school, we did leg locks very early. It is not usual in some schools that we do that. Uh, so I think he was getting ready for a fight, and he mentioned to you know before we roll, oh, let's let's do you know leg locks in the uh, while we train uh, because he was getting ready. So I think it was people there outside and he, we start, you know, training and I, you know, got him in a, in a leg lock, right? Like, and then, you know, I shake hands and continue training, but I noticed that he was looking outside. If somebody, uh, look at him, right. If somebody look the ro- like what happened. So mm. when we roll again, he started going a little harder, kind of like, you know, hitting, uh, my neck a little harder, kind of going a little tougher. But in during that row, I got him again with another leg lock. And yeah, that time he got like really upset. They didn't, he didn't say anything, but again, he started again going like harder. And again, I noticed that he was just looking outside or looking if they, people who was there uh, saw the, the row. And the third time, we did it again and you know I called him again with a leg lock and he was frustrated, but he got up and he kicked me. He kicked me in the chest. And I yeah, I kinda lost it a little bit. I didn't I, I kinda was lost and, and didn't got it because I was 
yeah, for me it was nothing. We were just training, and I was just sitting waiting for him to restart the the, the match. Uh, but he kicked me, and then when we get up, he started insulting me in Portuguese, right? And I I live in Brazil for a while, and I I, I understand Portuguese. And then I saw, okay, uh, this is a fight. So I answer back, and we got we got in a little uh, trouble there, and the people got in the middle, separate, you know. Um, but fast forward when I had my school or, or when I've been working in our academies, uh, for someone else, uh, I used to, when somebody was like that or being, uh, too rough or bully, I, I used to warm up and get in, put the round and go very hard with the person. I feel the, yeah, again, I feel that the, that's like a lot of testosterone and kind of necessary. Now, fast forward on my own place, I kind of around the time that I started my academy, I had a bad uh, neck injury. Uh, so it didn't allow me to to train how how I used to train. So now if I see something like that, I, I, I will just talk to the person. Now I understand sometimes uh, no one born knowing uh, how to act or how uh, maybe it's the culture of an academy. So I, I probably, you know, will stop the round, talk to the person and explain that we're here to, to learn and not to, not to like beat anybody up. Uh, but I, I will give them maybe like a couple fair warnings. They probably the second or third time I will say, you know, it's, you know, if, if I see that one more time, you you won't be able to train anymore in the school. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I handle the 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 situations now. I, I recognize it very early and I stop and talk to the person right away. Uh, yeah, I just don't let it es- escalate um, more than that. I, I think that's important. I think it's the escalation piece mm-hmm. that a lot of instructors miss because you. As an instructor, you want to let people work their own stuff out. But at the same time, you don't want to give them the space to think that treating other people poorly is okay. Mm. And finding balance there isn't always easy. And it, it, it sounds like you've got a good handle on it. Most instructors I know have a good handle on it because you got you to be there. You got to understand, you know, kind of look behind the eyes what's going on is that person just you know were they actually trying to hurt somebody mm. or you know did they did that particular movement just happen with a little bit more force than they'd intended right there's a big difference there yeah you know the i know when you just start mainly as a beginner right you uh grappling i feel is very very similar as a, as a real fight in the sense that you can go, uh, you know, I don't know if, if we're doing like a boxing, for example, or, or I don't know, karate, other, other martial art, you, you can't get hit or, or spar. I, I, I think every day, um, uh, like full force, you, you will get hurt or probably you will lose students very fast. Nobody likes to be getting punched in the face every day. Um, but in, in grappling, I feel you, you can grapple, uh, you, you grapple every day, but when you start again, it's very, uh, foreign and, you know, if you feel like suffocated or something that you're not used to, people kind of freak out or act different. And, um, so one thing that I implement in my school, I add actually a, a program that is the beginner program and I keep them there uh, for a while until they learn more their body and more techniques. But I, I really be, make a big separation of people who start um, their training to know the spar and not the... Uh, yeah, mainly no, don't don't spar until they have like a couple of stripe on their on, on their on their belt, uh, mm. just to get used to. Um, once I feel the the they are ready, they kind of move up to the next uh, class that it will be like the fundamentals, and even then 
they don't, they still, they, they don't have yet like full sparring. They will have like a positional sparring. So then they, they will practice a position where, uh, if we did, I don't know, like escaping, uh, the mount, for example, so somebody's on top of you. So we will start from that spot. They have a partial training where they all only have to get out of the spot and the training is stopped when, t- when they, uh, escape or the other person I submit them. Right. But, um, it is, uh, limited. And then when they are ready to move, to move up to advance or again, they're ready. And I see that they are not more a threat for the partner or themselves, you know, uh, then they get invited to advance when they're more controlled, they breathe better. Um, yeah. And then they're, they're able to, to last a, a, a round without getting hurt. Right. Mm, that makes sense. I like the priority on learning the skills in this, you didn't quite call it a beginner class, but this space, this separate class for newer students. Mm-hmm. It's a, um, it's something that I, I've seen a lot of schools do, but not all schools and the schools that do it seem to have better results. Mm. You know, it, it seems to reinforce the importance and, you know, let, let's remember, I, I don't know how many, I don't know if you do. I don't know if the people listening all remember their first day training. I don't remember my first day training, but I've been around for plenty of other people's first days mm. training. And they're nervous. Mm. And the more black belts you put around them, the more nervous they are. Yeah. You flood them with other white belts. They say, okay, everybody here sucks just as much as I do. I can wrap my head around this. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Yeah, I feel the okay. before. Um, yeah, I, I did have the schools back in Ecuador when I was uh, younger. Um, and then our, I only have like one uh, group of adults. And for me, an intro class, when a new person come, it was to literally spar with everyone and make him feel how strong Jiu Jitsu is, right? Like that's, that was kind of the intro class before. And yeah, I just can't even believe that I had people training like for real i don't know how i, I did uh, uh signups at that, that time but uh yeah really like the intro was kind of beat up the person so he feel how how effective the martial art was um but fast forward uh or kind of thinking back yeah i didn't have uh, too too much uh students no experience really uh but later, uh, you know, here I, I, I learned to separate, you know, the, the, the fundamentals with the advanced class. Uh, but now recently in, in my school, I, I add the third, the third program that will be the beginner, even, even uh, less contact. And one thing, too, that I feel before it was only for young people, the training, like only... You were only looking for the competitor or the tough person. Mm. And, but really, like as a martial artist, the, the goal, it is to build up the, the people, right? Like a, a female or an older uh, person or, or a lighter guy, like whoever. Uh, I, I feel very deeply that our job is to build them up to become that, that or tough person. No, no eliminate the, the weak, right? Um, but jujitsu, or I, I feel martial arts in general is for it is for for everyone. Everyone should be able to practice, regardless the 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 age or maybe the size, and uh, is all how how you are able to. I think manage your your different intensity of classes, and maybe also the culture of the of the academy. It's just people know to take care of each other. Uh, but it is important, even the beginner or the, or the, or a fundamental class, I feel that it, it doesn't matter your belt. You should, as, as a black belt, I'm always trying to, to learn, uh, or to sharp my fundamentals or my beginners, right? Like sometimes we have people or higher belt students, they, they, for some reason they had to stop or they had an injury, you know? So when they come back, they, 
uh, it's hard to come back uh, and go to an advanced class or spar for for an hour, right? Same as, the, as to going to the gym. You go to the gym, you haven't been in a long time, you can go like and live the same way, uh, expect to live the same way if you haven't lived in, I don't know, like even, I don't know, four months, you can go back and train with the same intensity. You won't be able to even walk the next day. So <laughs> I feel that yeah. having, having different levels of, of class, it allows to, you know, other people to always be in, uh, in a safe place where they can train, um, welcoming for, for females or lighter, lighter, uh, uh, people, or even your advanced, um, the students are coming back. They have a place where they can, uh, gradually or progressive, uh, coming back. Right. I feel that yeah. is important. What's coming. What's next. You know, it, it sounds like you're all in on the school and, and, oh. I completely understand why. That's absolutely not a negative judgment. I, I, I wish I was there. That would be great. I, you know, if we're doing our own thing. I'm all in on, on this, which is kind of my own version of a school. But I, you know, I look forward. I look into the future. I think of what's coming. I'm sure you do too. What is in the future? Are there, are there plans? What are you thinking? Yeah, so now I am very, very focused on, on building my instructor's base. So again, I, with all the past experience and uh, uh, well, knowledge and experience, maybe, you know, training in different places and um, I'm already running multiple schools. Uh, through the years you know again like mm. this, this is my uh my first uh successful i feel that now it's gonna be my seven year anniversary i feel my first uh successful uh, school in us but you know people who see from the outside really don't know but i had i had have many uh, schools this is not the uh you know the the one time uh lucky success it's been a lot of uh uh trials and error and with that i now i focus a lot on developing instructors i kind of want to give uh a path i feel that uh for me i was lost for a lot i don't want to say lost because I, i i always had the same goal in mind but i remember family uh you know, kind of intervention saying, okay, what are you going to do with your life? Kind of like what it, you know, like, um, not believing or not seeing what I was doing. And again, because I was always changing cities and and traveling a lot. Um, but it has always, always with the same goal of, you know, getting my black belt, having my school and I, I, that never changed. The place has changed against circumstances and uh, opportunities, right? It changed. Um, but uh, now I just feel that it's so many like young people, they are lost. They don't know what to do, how to do it. Uh, people, they come and they only, I don't know, they want to fight and make like uh, MMA or fighting their, their, their life. And I try to put them in a path where, yeah, you can compete. You should, uh, uh, of course, train, get ready, uh, prepare yourself, but also uh, learn how to teach, learn how to communicate, learn how the academy works. You know, you uh, you you know that you're not always gonna be young and full of energy, right? You should be uh, pursuing your maybe competition, but at the same time. Uh, have your plan B in case things don't work, but also even if they work, what are you going to do after competition? So uh, if you don't know or don't train uh, or don't learn from the beginning, uh, it's going to be very hard for an athlete or uh, a competitor to start teaching after their, their competitive career. I feel that transition, uh, it should be hand to hand. 
um yeah and something that they can prepare like from the beginning instead of uh uh you know don't study and train the brain um only only the the only go to battle right like without a without a a, a plan what happened after yeah makes sense I assume you've got a website, social media, all that stuff that we can share with people. Yes. Yeah. What? What? Are, yep. Drop. Why don't you give us that information now for people who are who are listening and not going to make it to the show notes? Right. Yeah. So my association, the website is edjassociation.com. That's uh, okay. we have uh, again we have an uh, we have an affiliation program where. You know, we share our curriculums, uh, all our instructors' course. We have um, kind of all the all the academy related uh, things to our affiliate academies. Nice, nice. Okay, and and we will put that stuff in the show notes for for people who are driving or something. Okay. <laughs> Good stuff today. Thank you and this is the point where we we head out but you're the one with the final words so what do you want to tell everybody who's listening today you know how do you want to leave this yeah first uh, you know thank you so much for the for the spotlight I, I i appreciate it was awesome to to talk to you i hope i didn't ramble too much <laughs> <laughs> you rambled the exact right amount that's what we i, I love that part of the show just right. let people talk. You hear wonderful things. Amazing. Yeah, I just say say thank you, um, uh, you know, for having me again. Uh, if you are uh, a competitor, um, I do recommend if you is something that you want to dedicate your life to start not only stu study the martial art and the techniques, but start reading about like leadership, communication. Uh, marketing kind of prepare yourself and uh always be learning and um yeah again have an, an open mind it you know being a, having a school is not is not only knowing the the techniques of your specific martial art right you have to really always be learning always uh be curious and and find the the things that will make you your business successful, right? You know, it's amazing. Even for those of us who don't watch mixed martial arts, who don't pay attention to the UFC, it's so clear that so much of what we do, even as traditional martial artists today, has ties back to the UFC. We've had multiple people on just in the last year who credit watching the UFC with really changing their interest or even initiating their interest in training. I find that fascinating. JP, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing all the great stuff that you did. I look forward to talking to you again and hope we can connect in other ways. Hey, listeners, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Look at those great show notes that we put together for each and every episode. We've got photos, we've got links, we've got transcripts. I was trying to come up with something that would rhyme with links on the fly. I got nothing. But even without a rhyme, there's still good stuff over there for you. So check it out, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you're willing to support us and the work that we do, you've got choices. You could leave a review, buy a book, or help with the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick get over there if you haven't checked out what we do for patreon like really like gone to the website and said hey what's going on here go look trust me it's worth your time it's probably worth your money don't forget we've got a code podcast15 gets you 15 percent off at whistlekick.com our social media is at whistlekick and my email is jeremy at whistlekick.com until next time train hard smile and have a great day